So the first thing I want to talk about is the quiz we have tomorrow. So are you ready to take the quiz? Um, I just want to mention that I gave some advices for this quiz in our website. So please read it, OK? It basically says how to study it. Can you, can you read it? Is it big enough? So it says March 21st, how to prepare the first quiz. And it says review reading guide one to four. So that's uh, what to do number one. Use them to read a textbook. So that's number two. And we solve all examples and exercises there. Number three. And review homeworks. One to two. Number four. So if you do them all, you will be fine. I'm sure about that. What we do today is not going to be included. The quiz. It's a closed book. So the uh, key is to um, do the homework again. Because it's not going to be exact the same, but it will be close enough to the homework questions. So if you review the homeworks and solve the uh, exercises again, then you will know what to do. Okay. So I just, I just made it. And I plan to give you three questions. Okay, and originally I gave you 35 minutes and I uh, was thinking about it and have another thought. Now I decide to give you 30 minutes. Okay, should be enough as long as you do all of these things. And only for this time, so tomorrow after quiz, there's no lecture. Okay, so. If you complete the quiz early enough, then you can just go home. It will be more like an exception than the rule. So that's the plan this week. <coughs> what else? Um, do you have any questions? Anything else? Oh, by the way, when I give you a quiz, I want you to write down your answers in the blank of something like that, OK? I'm going to give you enough blank. So usually, this one page has one question, simple question, and a lot of blank. So write down your calculations and write down your answer. If you need more space, then you can use the back of the same page, OK? That should be enough. OK, so today we are going to start our discussions on the linear regression. <coughs> so this is my plan. Our first note is day five, so I plan to do it today. Okay, so that's what we are going to do. And tomorrow we have a quiz. Next Tuesday, I'm going to solve. I'm going to finish day six, the next one. So that's Tuesday. And on Wednesday, we are going to have another R session about how to read data set, and how to run a simple regression, things like that. OK? OK, so um, do you have this reading guide, day five? In the first line, what did it say? It says, read pages 107 to 112. Did you do it? Did you read these pages? I'll give you more time to get used to. But when you read such a thing, then you're supposed to read the textbook okay, before you come. And then the next sentence says, review terminologies there. So there's a lot of terminologies that uh, you need to remember. So let me just uh, start to give you a few. So when we say a simple regression, this is what we mean. So we have y and we have x. 
y is the <coughs> dependent variable. x is the independent variable. So y is something we like to know, we like to understand. x is something we can control. Okay? I'll give you an example. So in our textbook, the main example is the test scores. So we like to know why some classes have high test score and some classes have low test score. We also like to know why some students can achieve higher, some achieve very low. Okay, so we like to know the uh, variations in test score. And what kind of variable you can control? In this example, the class size. So we have a class of 51, which is quite large. So the question is, if you control class size, make it smaller, make it bigger, can you manipulate, can you change the test score? Okay, so that's the question. So we, we say that the class size is an independent variable of this example, and the test score becomes the dependent variable of this example. Again, the main goal is to understand the test score, why some class do better than others. Okay? Now, the second example, just I'm going to use a lot. Dependent variable is wages, and independent variable is years of education. Again, we like to know why some people make a lot of money and why some people don't make that much. Okay, we like to know the variation, and we like to understand the variations in wages in terms of the education. Perhaps it's because some people get more education. Okay, again, we are not actually interested in the years of education. This is our tool. But we just like to know the variations in wages. This is our interest. Now, so why we have this index I? I means the first class, second class, something like that, okay? In the first example. And for the second example, I can go to 1 to n means first worker, the second worker, things like that, okay? So that's the index. So this is a linear line. For x, we call it the regression line. Now, any linear line has two, two components, two parameters, the intercept and the slope, okay? So let me just write it in a different color. So this is the intercept. And this is the slope. So the idea is, Let's think about this first, first example, test score and class size. So this is x, this is y. So we like to understand the variations in y in terms of the variations in x. So the y has some variations, right? Some class has a very high test score. Some classes has a low test score. And they also have variations in class size too. So our idea is maybe this straight line somehow summarize the relationship between two. But there's a problem though. Now suppose that this point, xi is 21, okay, just as an example. And we can find plenty of classes with the same class size, right? Maybe there are hundreds of classes, the class size of 21. But we also know that they're not going to have the same test score. 
Why? So suppose that there are only two classes, and they have very different test score, although they have the same class size, 21. So why class A does better than B? Maybe their teachers are better. Maybe their students are better. Inputs are better. Maybe the class A takes an exam in the morning at 9 o'clock. Class B takes in the afternoon, 4 p.m., right? So there's a bunch of other things can influence why the dependent variable besides our independent variable, right? So this x, this class size, is maybe one of many, more than 100 factors that determine the test score. So although we just write it in this way, we have to admit that there's something else that we cannot see. Some other variable that's not included in the data set. Right? So all those things that's not observed, or that's not included in our data set, goes to here. So for example, the variations in test score is explained by the variations in class size, but variations in teacher's quality, the student's input, the family background of students, and when they take their exam. Is it Monday or Friday afternoon? Okay? All those variables go into here, simply because we don't observe them. We don't have them in the data. So in that sense, UI is called the error term. So we call it an error, but it doesn't mean that we actually make a mistake somewhere. It simply means that this is a part that we do not know about the test score. Okay? So suppose that there is this factory that determines the test score, some black box. And some part of the black box we can understand. That's this part. Because we know the variations in class size. It's in the data. But every other thing that we don't have in the data is simply unexplainable in, in, in terms of something we can observe. So that's more like the um, unexplained territory for the determination of why. Okay? So those things are called this uh, error. Again, this is, it doesn't mean that somebody's making a mistake here. So go back to this example. So class A may have a class test score like this. So suppose that this is a test score of class A. And class B may have a test score like this, right? So again, why that's the case? They have the same input in terms of class size, but for the first class, class A has an error, right? Which is favorable to them for, for that case. So for them, they have a positive and big errors. That's why their actual outcome is above the regression line. And for these guys, their errors and negative and big. So that's why their outcomes are much lower than the regression line, okay? So that's the load of this error. So we explained why x and u in that model. So what is left is the uh, interceptance of. So let's think about this further. Now let's ignore the error for a while. What's the meaning of an intercept? What does it mean? This is an intercept, right? This is the value of y. And x happens to be 0, right? So beta is approximately y, and x is equal to 0. So this is a test score. And the class size is zero. In this example is not that meaningful because there's no students. What's the meaning of test score? Right? So we don't emphasize interpretation for this example, but sometimes it can be very meaningful. Now, what is beta one? The slope.
What's the meaning of slope? So this is a slope, right? The tangent. This is changes in x, and this is changes in y. The slope is simply the ratio, right? Now, just an example. Suppose that you reduce your class size by 1.5, whatever that means. Okay. Now your test score actually goes up by six. So this is changes in x and this is changes in y. But it's a ratio, right? You can simplify it such that the denominator becomes one all the time. And what's the value of the numerator? It's going to be minus 9, right? No, sorry. <laughs> Is it minus 4? So it seems like there are two ways to interpret. So the first way is when I reduce my class size by 1.5, the test score goes up by 6. This is one way to say this. Or, this is another way. And I increase my class size by 1, and the test score goes down by 4. They are the same thing, right? Usually, the second one is easier to remember and to use. So this is a standard interpretation of the slope. So basically, beta 1 says changes in y then we make changes in x by 1. OK, let me repeat. Beta 1 is equal to changes in y. When changes in x is 1. <coughs> OK? Because, again, it's a ratio. And because you can simplify any ratios. So that's what beta 1 is. Now suppose that we know beta 1. Somehow the value is given, minus 4. That's the effect. Then how can you calculate the changes in y? You can just multiply these changes in x in both sides, right? It's coming from this definition. Now we can calculate the effect of a policy. Okay, suppose that. So the effect is minus four. That's beta one. That's a slope. My plan is to reduce the class size by three. This is my plan. So what is the expected increase in test score? That's twelve. Okay. So essentially, that's how you calculate the benefit of a policy. This is the benefit of this policy. Out of those five elements, five things, we can observe two in our data set. So what you can observe? So we know y from the data set, and we also know x. So y and x are given by a data. What we cannot observe is ui, the error term. Because we do not know the quality of teacher. That's not in the data set. That's why it goes into the error. If you know the quality of the teacher, it can be a part of x, right? So that's a set of everything that we cannot observe. Now, beta 1 and beta nr is something called unknown. So this summarizes the relationship between x and y as long as, it, as long as you know the regression line. Do you know the regression line? Do you know the relationship between the test score and the class size? Normally, we have no idea. We don't know what is the intercept or is slope. They are unknown. 
There's something you have to find out. Okay? So the goal of the regression analysis is to figure out these two unknowns. So what's the value of the intercept? What's the value of the slope? Okay? So that's the goal. Is it clear so far? Okay, then how can we find it out? An observation. So that is what is called a data set. Okay, so in the Excel file, it comes in an Excel file. It says in the first column, it says Y and bunch of numbers, N numbers. X, bunch of numbers. Again, a column means a variable, like test score, and a low means an individual, or a class. Okay? So that's the meaning of collect a random sample of n observation. Because these two numbers are unknown, we use this sample of n observations to find it out. Okay? We cannot find out the exact value because the information we have is finite. They're limited. But what you can hope for is find something close to these numbers. Okay? So how? How we can find it out? <coughs> there are many ways. One way we consider is this. So how to estimate Estimate basically means find out using a sample. So the uh, method we are going to use is this. Now let's call this function this way. So what does it do? Now this is the value of the test score, okay, given by a sample. Now in some sense, you know, something we can predict is up to here. This is totally unpredictable. Okay, so once, if you know the regression line, meaning that if you know the intercept and slope, what you can predict is up to here. And this is going to be your prediction. I predict that the class test score is something because intercept and slopes are such values and the class size is 21. Okay, in that sense, this is a prediction from the regression. So actual test score minus my prediction. So in some sense, this is a prediction error. We square them, and we add them up. In some sense, this is a total squared prediction error. So the method is, we choose beta null and beta 1 such that the sum of squared prediction error is minimized. Does it make sense? So the idea is this. We don't like to make a big errors, big prediction errors. We like to make it as small as possible. But making it zero is impossible. Okay? So we can go only up to some, 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 some spots. And we also like to care about the prediction errors for everybody, every class. So that's why we just sum them up with equal weight. 
So I like to have an aggregate prediction error. So my idea of aggregation, ag aggregate prediction error, and this is just one possible method. If you don't square it, then they just cancel out, right? Positive error cancels out negative error. So this doesn't work. You cannot simply add them up. You either have to square it, or take the absolute value, or something else. And then you aggregate them, and you think about how to minimize. Okay. So that's why we have such an expression. So the goal is By the way, this is the uh, sum of square errors. Okay. So why we do this? A lot of justification. One thing is that it is good to minimize sums of prediction error, right? Why not? It's a good thing to do. We want justification. Second justification is, this is a very easy problem to solve. So we do this because it's feasible and easy to do. There may be some other method, but it's much harder. Second justification. There are more. Third justification. It turns out that if you do it, if you find your intercept and slope in such a way, it turns out to have some good properties. OK? And we are going to study those good properties later. There are tons of justification. But for now, let's just assume that this is the method we have. Whether we like it or not, this is the method we are going to use to find out the intercept and slope. OK? Are you up to the task? Now, if you read the lecture notes, <coughs> the reading guide, It has explanations here and there. So it says, let's make it simpler. OK, let's think about uh, something easier. A regression without x. OK, that's in page number two. It's an easier problem to solve. So we just view it as an exercise. And then in page number three, it has a step to actually minimize this function as a function of interceptance. Of I don't want to say too much because you already know how to minimize this guy. We have done it already in the uh, first problem set, the first homework. That's the example six in problem set one. Do you remember that? I used a slightly different notation, so just for you to remember. I gave you something like this. And then we find the value of a and b such that that value minimizes this function. Okay, sum of squared prediction error. Do you remember this? Is it correct? Is it example six? So we say that a hat, b hat, is the solution of this problem. achieves the minimum of f. Now, let's take a look and compare them. What's the difference? Essentially the same problem, right? And that's why uh, you had this example in the problem set. So the only difference is I used to call it an f, small f. Now I call it a large t. 
I used to call two variables a and b. Now I call it beta nor and beta. Null. The solution was used to be called a hat and b hat. So if you have a solution from this problem, you simply call it beta nor hat and beta one hat, right? So basically, it's the same problem. So we can. So the thing is that we can do it. We can solve it. So uh, I take some time, and I let you solve this problem one by one, one step by next step. Okay. So let's do it together. So what you can do? What do you? What, what do you want to do? When you see a function like this, if you recall this exercise six. You want to take the partial derivative, right? Now, can you take the partial derivative of t? With respect to beta nor. And can you also take the partial derivative of t? With respect to beta 1, can you do it? Now uh, you take the uh, derivative of this guy with respect to beta and R. So we use a chain rule, right? Two times. Are we done? <coughs> no. No? So what else we need? Minus one, right? This is the chain rule. What about this? Now, you take this. Again, differentiation goes inside. And you take <coughs> the partial derivative with respect to beta 1. So, summation of and what do you have? Do you have minus beta 1? No, you have minus x1. So we have two partial derivatives. To find a solution, to find the minimum, the first of the conditions says make them equal to 0, right? Force them equal to 0. And make two equations. Now let's think about it. Let's simplify. So we have 2 and minus 1. So minus 2. It's a constant. Can you pull it out of the summation sign? Can you do that? So we have minus 2 over here. Now you can just divide everything by minus 2. So it disappears, right? Is it OK? That's our equation number one. Let's do the same thing. We have minus two. We actually have minus two times xi. Now, can I pull out minus two xi outside the summation? Is it okay? Can I pull out the entire thing? And then I just divide by everything by minus 2xi. Remove it. Is it OK? No, right? Why? For this summation, xi is not a constant. Because x1 is different from x2, right? It's not a constant for this summation. So you cannot pull it out. So you have to keep xi here. But you can pull out minus 2 because it's a constant. So can you see the difference? Now we divide everything by minus 2. You can remove it. So let's call it equation number 2. So that's the two equations in page number 3. In the middle of page number 3, it says equation point 3 equation point four. Now there are a few exercises there. 
Now, if you solve it, we are done. We just call it hat. Okay. <laughs> Example one says solve the first equation and find an expression. Blah. So why don't you try? So the uh, idea is that the value of beta null and beta one that satisfy this equation equal to zero, and these equations are called hats, beta hats. They are fixed numbers. Once you fix your sample, these numbers are fixed, unique. Okay? So let's put solution hats. Because otherwise, it's not going to be zero. If beta, beta nerd can take any, anything, then this is not going to be zero. At this very special value, the minimum point, it becomes zero, right? So in that sense, I put hats over there. So what is left is to find out the expressions for these hats. So the task is simplify this equation and figure out the expression appeared in example one, in page number three. So why don't you try? So from one. Get <coughs> now we have something, right? So we divide everything by n. Then what is this? My bar, the sample mean. Okay. So that's zero. So beta nor hat. So that's an expression for the intercept. The thing is this. So far, we haven't solved anything. Because it depends on beta 1 hat, which is unknown. Right? But this is still useful. Right? It's more like a middle step, although it's not a solution to any. So that's example 1. Now example 2 says, solve this equation. So we're going to solve this, this equation. When you do that, you can use an expressions for beta nor hat. So basically the idea is you plug this expression over here and then simplify the summation. Okay? So why don't you try? So we plug this expression over here. Okay? Let me start to write it. <coughs> That's equal to zero. So now we have four terms, right? Before I go further, let me simplify. So we have y i minus y bar. And I put these two terms together because they have the common term, right? Better one hat is common. Both of them. Better one hat x i minus x bar. Is it correct? This is minus, this is plus, so we have minus and plus. Seems to be correct. And then I apply the summation. <coughs> so that's equal to zero. A better one hat is a constant, so you just put it out.
Then I move this term over there, divide by everything. The terms that seems to be right. Then we have this expression. So there's nothing wrong with this, but we are not exactly done yet. It's not convenient enough. So the final step is to show, by the way, do you have any questions to this? You just solved a two by two equations, right? So that's example two. Example three wants you to show that is example three. Uh, this is actually always the same as so that's example example three. Okay, so it's, it appears that the difference is here you only have x i right. But in this expression, you have xi minus x bar. So this term shouldn't change anything for the numerator and denominator. Okay? That's example two. If you have to show more, we can go further. You can actually show that. You can even show that this is actually equal to that. But for us, this is kind of unnecessary. So let's focus on this equality. Okay. Now, our job is to show that this numerator is the same as this one. And this denominator is the same as this one. So why don't you try? So you have two things to show. Is it okay? So I just view it as just one term, single term, and I apply xi to the single term, x bar to the single term, and I just apply the summations. <coughs> Now, the big trick here is see that x, y is a constant. If you fix your sample, sample mean of x is a number, like 22 or 2,001.5, things like that. x, y is a constant if you fix your sample. So you can put it out.
Now the argument is this must be zero. Can you see why? Well, if y is the center of y, right? So the positive value will be canceled out by the negative value exactly. That's the meaning of center. Okay? So to make it official, my claim is this should be equal to zero. Why? So I apply summation, summation sign to each. Again, y bar is a constant. Right? So summation of a constant is n times the constant. Right? Now what is the uh, definition of y bar, the summation of yi divided by n. So we have a cancellation of n and n. So it's summation yi minus summation yi makes the two. Okay? So we just show that this guy, the numerator, should be equal to this guy, the numerator of the second expression. And use the same idea, you can show the denominator. They are the same, okay? Check it. So this must be true by example three. Let me ignore it for a while. So that's an expression for beta one hat. Now if you think about it, it looks very familiar. If you divide everything by n minus one, what is this term? Sample covariance. Sample covariance of x and y. What is this? Sample variance. So if you can find out the sample covariance and variance, then you can find out the slope. You can estimate the slope. OK? So the slope of a line is actually simply a ratio of covariance and variance. <coughs> so. So let me summarize it, and I'll give you an example, OK? So it seems like that we have an expression for beta 1 hat. It's right there. <coughs> so by using a sample of data, you can figure it out. Once you find out the uh, slope, and you can use the value over here. And you can use two sample me. And you can figure out the intercepts, right? So I'll give you an example exercise, which is in page number four and five. That's example four. OK? So basically there, I summarized a sample of 20 observations. And I give you some summation of y, summation of x, and summation of something squared. Use this information and figure out, estimate the slope and the intercept. Okay? I'll give you five minutes, no, three minutes. Is it correct? What did you get? It's kind of minus 1 half, right? A little bit smaller than that. What did you get exactly? Minus 4 four, 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 5. Okay. So how do you get y bar? Summation of y divided by sample size minus Beta 1 hat, which is minus 
x bar. So what's your intercept? Okay. So, out of sample of 20, size 20, we get an estimate, our guess, of the slope and intercept. Once you have it, we can use it for the regression line. Now, let me just repeat. This is the regression line, right? If you add the error term, then we have our model. But before the error term, that's the uh, line we are interested in. So these two are unknown numbers. So our job is to collect a sample of 20 in this example. And we use this sample to estimate these two numbers. So we just got 1.87 for our estimate of beta nerve minus 0.45 or estimate for beta 1. And in some sense, that's our estimate for the dependent value. Okay? So in that sense, we call a y hat. So why it's a hat? It's because essentially this is a value from beta hat. Now the huge difference between these two is these two are unknowns. But these two are known numbers. Okay? So we can actually use them. For example, to make a prediction. By the way, I put hats on top of y because this is the value of y using beta hats, okay? So this is how you make a prediction. So for example, it says that how to predict a test score of a class whose class size is 21. How do you do that? Just use 21 in xi. So your prediction is this minus 0.45 times 21. That's your prediction for that class. Now, can you make an exact prediction? Again, that's impossible because actual yi is not produced from this model. Actual yi is actually produced from the regression line plus the error, right? And we have no idea about this term. We don't know the teacher's quality, student's quality, timing of the exam, the family background, something like that. So we cannot predict this guy. So when we say, I predict, that means we do as much as we can, okay? Up to here, at the whole thing. So we are going to make an error. And once you fix the sample, you can quantify the error. So this is the actual test value that's from the data set. And this is my predicted value. And the difference is the error. So this is an error that we calculate using those hats. So I call it UI hat. This YI hat is called the predicted value or fitted value. And the difference between the actual and predicted value is called the residual. UI without hat is the error, right? It's a collection of everything that is not observed, but determines the uh, dependent variable. UI hat is something slightly different. This is an actual prediction error you're going to make in your sample. Now, how to use it? So we're not going to do it together, but there's example five. 
in the reading guide, and that's how you use this. Uh, these two things. So, okay. So let me let me stop at this point. But please study very hard. This is your first quiz, and you know the first thing is also very important, maybe the most important. So I want you to do a good job tomorrow. Okay. I see you.